Welcome to worship at home. This morning we celebrate Epiphany. We remember the visit of the Magi and how they came to worship the Christ child. We remember their journey, their perseverance, and their commitment to following the star and worship, worship, and to worship the one truly worthy of worship. And so you too are called to come and pay him homage. You will be called to worship by Ross Andrew, who will sing We Three Kings. You will be called to worship by Chris Tessman, who will read to you from the prophet Isaiah. Come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Oh, 
first reading from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 60, verses 1 through 7. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes, look around. They all gather together, they come to you. Your sons shall come from far away, your daughters shall be carried on their nurses' arms. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and rejoice, because the abundance of the sea shall be brought to you. The wealth of the nations shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you. The young camels of Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense and shall proclaim the praise of the Lord. All the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered to you and the rams of Nebioth shall minister to you. They shall be acceptable on my altar and I will glorify my glorious house. Let us pray. O Holy One, we have come to pay you homage. We have come seeking light. We have come in spite of the obstacles to our coming. Enlighten us with your word, we pray. Comfort us with the peace of your presence. Inspire us to act courageously in the week ahead. We ask these blessings for ourselves and all in our church family who worship with us from their homes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The second reading from Matthew chapter 2, verses 7 through 20. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from their, them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had been seeking at its rising. That they had seen at its rising. Until it stopped over the, the place where the child was, when they saw the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with, with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. Now after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated, and he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem, who were two years old or under. According to the time he had learned from the wise men, then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, while wailing aloud, wailing in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they were no more. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those 
who were seeking the child's life are dead. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts and minds upon the scriptures be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. King Herod had no intention of paying homage to the baby Jesus. He lied to the Magi about his intention to pay homage to someone greater than himself. King Herod cared about King Herod. He cared so much about himself and his own hold on power that he sought out and killed whatever he could not master and control, even if that were those in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and younger. Rather than welcoming the future with wonder and joy, Herod chose to slaughter it with a vengeance. The Magi, on the other hand, were strangers. They were foreigners. They were Gentiles. They were not from the country. They were not from the same faith tradition. They were outsiders who followed a star wherever it led them. They sought something outside themselves that was better than themselves, something worthy of their honor and their respect. They desired to be in the presence of what was of the earth, and yet transcended our material life. And through the power of humbling themselves and acknowledging their own incompleteness, they became more than they had been, more than they could become without him. They themselves were not the light, but they sought the light and reflected the light that had come into the world. King Herod's stance toward the new king could not have been more different. He hated the very thought of being replaceable or transcended. He was unable to accept the fact of his, of his own mortality, and so he enjoyed no peace within himself. He lived in darkness. He attempted to destroy the one who was destined to succeed him. We can see a similar kind of drama playing out in our own country today. President Trump has made it clear to us that if you have principles that supersede your allegiance to him, even if you are a member of his own party, even if you voted for him, if you dare to hold the Constitution above him, if you are led by principle, by the light of principle, he will unleash hatred upon you. He will, he will fan the flames of violence. He will stand back and say nothing, while those who um, purport to be his followers unleash their hatred upon you and pursue you and the members of your family with death threats. I am talking specifically about Gabriel Sterling. He is a Republican who voted for Donald Trump this past November. He is also an election official in the state of Georgia. For doing his job and placing the integrity of the democratic process above his own political preferences, for putting the will of the people above his own personal comfort and security, Sterling has received death threats from those purporting to support Donald Trump. In early December, Mr. Sterling asked the president to step up and stop inspiring people to commit potential acts of violence. He added, 
Someone is going to get hurt. Someone is going to get shot. Someone is going to get killed. And it's not right. Mr. Sterling said that people had intruded upon Brad Raffensperger's personal property at the same time that Raffensperger's wife was receiving sexualized threats through her personal cell phone. So imagine if this were you and your family, people coming onto your property while your wife or a loved one is receiving sexualized threats through her personal cell phone. Brad Raffensperger, the Republican Secretary of State, is also a supporter of Donald Trump's policies and also voted for him, also a Republican. As bad as the threats received by Sterling and his supervisor Raffensperger were, Sterling said that the straw that broke the camel's back was the threat against an innocent 20-year-old young man. The young man was a contractor for a voting system company in Gwinnett County, Georgia. The young worker had been targeted by someone who hung a noose and declared that the worker should be hung for treason. This innocent 20-year-old was accused of treason for simply doing a routine element of his job, serving democracy by maintaining a voting system. To protect the identity of the innocent, Mr. Sterling, like the Magi, did not provide those who threatened violence with any further details. Mr. Sterling dared to be guided by democratic principles that were higher and greater than allegiance to Donald J. Trump. The Magi dared to go to Jerusalem, to the seat of power, and to announce their higher loyalty to a king who was greater than Herod. In November, more than 81 million Americans dared to exercise their freedom, to be guided by their consciences, and to get to cast their ballots for someone other than President Trump. King Herod took his revenge by attempting to destroy the future king. Herod didn't care about the collateral damage the lives of all the children, two years old and younger, in and around Bethlehem. But their mothers cared. Their mothers wept and could not be consoled because their children were no more. President Trump is taking his revenge upon our democracy and the presidency he doesn't care about the collateral damage, the damage done to our Constitution and to our love for one another as fellow Americans. King Herod and President Trump agree that if the future is not going to be about them, the future can go straight to hell. According to them, they owe nothing to anyone who failed to directly promote them, their interests, and their agendas. Trump and Herod came not to serve, but to be served. As an American, I worry about the rule of law, what's happening to it. I worry about what's happening to our treasured principle of one person, one vote of what's happening to equality under the law, what's happening to the peaceful transfer of power upon which we have always depended. As a Christian minister, I am deeply concerned about the worship of the one true God. A seminary professor who taught the New Testament said that as Americans, we no longer have a king or pay homage to a king, but our leader is the president. 
As the embodied representative of we, the people, he elicits our respect and admiration. If we are to bring our faith up to date, keeping it fresh and vital, this seminary professor said, we need to stop thinking about Jesus, the king, since kingship has faded from memory and lost its centrality to our daily living. He said, we need to start thinking in terms of President Jesus. What happens when we think of Jesus as the powerful one at the center of our lives? When we think of Jesus as the leader of the free world? This sermon is not about your politics. It's not about whatever economic policies you prefer. It's not about who you voted for or what party you belong to. It's about who you worship. It's about whether you think Jesus is greater and more deserving of homage, of praise, and of your loyalty than President Trump or of any president who preceded him or will succeed him. And if Jesus is, how does who you worship govern how you respond when you hear about your fellow Americans harassed and threatened for being guided by the light of higher loyalties? As a Christian, I worry about anyone who exercises power and control by stirring up hate and animosity between people. I worry about hatred tipping over into violence and violence tipping over into murder. And at the far end of it all, and how many more steps does it take to get there? Genocide. Already we have learned from President Trump that if you didn't vote for him, your vote shouldn't be counted. How many steps are there from that assertion, from convincing millions of people that that's true, to convincing millions of people that if you didn't vote for him or you don't support him, that you shouldn't be counted as a person. Namely, that killing you would serve a larger and a greater good. After all, you're standing in the way of making America great again. You're a traitor, so maybe you'll simply have to go. It happened in Nazi Germany. Hitler was beloved and worshipped by many. He was seen as the great savior. He stirred people up and made them feel good about themselves and the potential of their future again. People paid Hitler homage. And the people who stood in the way of his agenda were slaughtered, as the innocent were slaughtered in Bethlehem in biblical times as they were slaughtered in Germany in the 20th century, so can genocide happen in America in the 21st century. If you and I fail to worship and pay homage to the one true God of universal love and peace. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good people to do nothing. After love was born into the world, one who found it effective to govern by fear slaughtered innocent children. What star will guide you? What leader will lead you? What principles compel you ever forward and ever on, onward? 
And will we, as a people, be enslaved by our fear of one another's differences? Or will we be led forward into something better by exercising our power to love? children and young people full of energy. We thank you for those who will live after us. Help us to be worthy of them and to provide them with what they will need to face life in the future without us. We thank you for the guidance and love we have received from those who came before us and how they have filled us with the good things we needed to live in this world, which is sometimes darkened by difficulty. We thank you that they have shined a light for us, shined a light upon our path. And we thank you now, especially for that great light you sent into the world to take on our flesh and to live among us. When things are at their darkest, help us always to see the light that shines in Bethlehem. Shed light upon the paths of all those walking through the valley of the shadow of death. We pray especially for Susan James, whose sister died on New Year's Day from COVID-19. And we pray for all those who have lost their loved ones to this dreaded disease. We pray especially for the family and friends of Ann Tuthill, a friend of P.J. Jemson's, who died on December 31st. We thank you for Ann's 97 years of life, her smile, her generosity, and her spunk. Where death has come, 
Give us space to mourn our losses. And in our mourning, remind us also that life continues. Lord, send us leaders who can see past their own losses so that we can be led by them to see past our own. Keep all our eyes fixed on our greatest leader, who even while dying on a cross could see beyond it to the future, who endured torture without becoming hateful, and who suffered violence without turning to violence. Gracious one, we ask you to pour out your mercy upon all who are suffering extreme and chronic pain. We pray especially for Joy Cummings, who has a fractured spine. We ask you in your mercy to touch her body and to heal her spine. And now, Lord, in the silence of these few moments, we turn to you in prayer with the names and the faces of those about whom we are most concerned. Holy One, we lift to you these prayers, both spoken and unspoken. In Jesus' name, amen. Good people all this Christmas time, consider well and bear in mind what our good God for us has done in sending his beloved Son with Mary holy, we should pray to God with love this Christmas day. In Bethlehem, upon that morn, there was a blessed Messiah born. <laughs> give you courage to bring light and love to the dark and frightened places of this world. Holy Jesus. 